So the Pentecost has just happened, right? This incredible, powerful experience. Now, of course, there's the experience of the people who witnessed it, who are noticing these podunk, backwoods, backwater people speaking their own language. Like, how do you know how to speak Cyrene? How do you know how to speak Parthian, right? All of a sudden, all these people that have been gathering for the celebration of Pentecost, remember, of course, that Pentecost is a Jewish festival for the giving of the law, the giving of the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai to Moses by God Almighty. It's a remembrance of that experience. So this was one of the three pilgrimage festivals, and Jerusalem was packed, packed with humans from all over the diaspora, people that had come many miles, journeyed weeks to get there. And so there's people from everywhere, and they're hearing this message, this message of God's love and salvation, this message of God's forgiveness and the redemption of creation, this message of inclusion and connection, of the power of God and the fulfillment of prophecy. But think about the experience from the perspective of the apostles. Now remember, of course, that Jesus had died, had been murdered by the state, and then had been resurrected and had appeared to them personally multiple times, depending on which of the Gospels you're reading. Had even come back around when, you know, I don't really believe that it happened. Only when I get to touch the glory bits will I believe that it happened. And then Jesus is like, okay, cool, that's what you need. I'm here for you. And then, of course, in Luke's rendering, we actually get the flyaway Jesus, we get to see his feet as he ascends into the heavens. But then, they're just kind of waiting around, kind of like waiting for instructions, like when your computer can't quite connect to the internet and you're waiting for the thing to download or you're waiting for it to open up and you're just like, okay, the spinning wheel is there. We just wait, right? And then all of a sudden, they get the download. The fiery tongues appear as above their heads, and they are filled with the spirit and energy that drives them out of their cloistered space with power out to witness to the community, not even knowing exactly why they're doing it or what they're going to do, probably not understanding even what they are saying, but knowing that it has to be said, knowing that it has to be done, that almost compulsion and energy. And they remember that they were promised that this would happen. The Advocate would come. The Holy Spirit would come upon them and show them what to do. And so they were faithfully waiting until such time as they had direction, until they received the insight about what it is that's supposed to happen next. They knew the world was different somehow. They knew that things had changed, and here they were confirmed in it. And I can't help but imagine that that whole time that they were sitting in that upper room, they were thinking, man, we knew this guy, and he knew us, and we were certain and convicted that he was full of the Spirit of God. This was the Anointed One, the Messiah. How in the world is anyone else going to know about this guy? And so when we catch them at this point in Acts chapter 2, they're just beginning to put together the how. The how are they going to do this? And at the end of the first reading, you saw four things listed. You saw four behaviors that are the concrete outcomes of how they're going to organize the community, why they're going to gather together, how they're going to keep the memory alive, and how they're going to pass the mantle of Jesus on from themselves who had firsthand experience to the next and the next and the next. Here it is reaching us 2,000 plus years later. And what are the four pillars? Teaching and fellowship and sharing and prayer. Teaching and fellowship and sharing and prayer. These are the concrete examples of what it's going to mean to be a community together. Now, we have to admit that the apostles had some powers that not very many of us have, right? They were able to go out and throughout the book of Acts, you're going to see this, that they lay hands on people and heal them. They cast demons out of people that have been possessed for decades. They are able to do miraculous signs and wonders. And some people have wondered, well, if that's what it means to have the Spirit, then why on earth isn't that what happens to me? When I receive an insight or a revelation, why can't I fix things that are wrong or broken in my life? 
Well, we know something about miracles. We know something about these encounters, these powerful experiences, that they capture our attention. But eventually they can't hold it because it's just a moment. It's just an encounter. It's an experience. And while we may have had many powerful and wonderful and even transcendent experiences, which I know many of you in this room have had, an experience that almost felt out of body, that felt amazing, where you had contact with something on the other side. It is, after all, just a moment, an encounter, an experience. And that's not what's going to lead people to Jesus. It might catch their attention, but it's not going to hold their attention. Because there needs to be a new reality that they're invited into. See, when they ask, well, what are we supposed to do? What do we do now that we've had this moment of clarity and insight? We, we see that this Jesus is something set apart, something different. We see it in you. We see it in these miraculous signs and wonders. What are we supposed to do? Peter's response is the same response that John gave. Repent. Be baptized into Jesus Christ. And then you'll receive the Spirit. And then we'll move on from there. Well, I have a six-year-old. Let me tell you a little something about repentance. It is not saying I'm sorry. <laughs> right? Ow, that hurts. Stop. Sorry. Do I believe that's not going to happen again? You better believe I do not believe that. <laughs> that is not repentance. Saying I'm sorry is not repentance. Any of you that have been wronged by somebody who apologized quickly, you were like, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, right? Repentance in the Greek is metanoia, which means to turn around, to turn again, or to renew your mind. It has this sense of coming to a new, full understanding. Often, I'm sorry is really about, oh, you didn't, that didn't work. I can't get what I want. That didn't work for you, for me to get what I want. I'm sorry. I'll try something else to get what I want. Repentance is about, oh, wow, I've been viewing the world in a greatly problematic way. My whole thought that doing violence to you to get what I want, that is a problem. Not that this particular act of violence didn't get me what I want, and I'll try something different later, right? That there needs to be this, this change of heart, really. This move from just knowing in the head to feeling it differently. And y'all talked about that, about what has helped you transition. If you look into what those insights were, a lot of it is about this change of heart and this connecting to this other way of being. A miracle might get our attention, but it's not going to keep our attention. What is going to keep our attention is building some practices to help us live into this new reality. And Acts chapter 2, verse 42, gives us four specific examples of what that would look like. Teaching, and fellowship, and prayer, and sharing. And this community, this new community that is built, is defined by these four behaviors, these four ways of being together. And what's amazing about it is they're radically different than how they had been living before, although they seem very simple. It's different because it's oriented differently. Now, we all know that attention is currency, especially in today's world, right? We are, uh, it's undeniable that, that just keeping someone's attention for more than 30 seconds is a damn miracle most of the time. How many times have you been in a conversation with somebody where they just ever so slyly, now they've got it on a watch, so you just think they're checking the time, but they're really reading text messages or scrolling the internet or God knows what, right? But like, how long can you keep someone's attention, especially if you're somebody who talks slowly? We get bored quick these days. I'm surprised that the radio even still exists, right? Because we're so hyper-stimulated. We know that attention is currency, that it is now a commodity, that even you are the product on social media. 
Social media may be full of ads, but you yourself and your attention is really the product that they are selling to advertisers. 15 seconds. Gold, right? We also know that attention is the way that we, the path to creating something new. That when we can focus our attention, that's when the possibilities abound, especially when we collectively focus our attention. Think about what this church has done and is planning to do by collectively focusing our attention on who we want to be in this community. This potential of a new redevelopment is part of the potential of a whole new way of understanding ourselves in and with the community, rather than the historical example we have of being separate from and trying to draw people in. What if now our attention is about drawing ourselves out? We were in the upper room and the spirit falls upon us. Where will the spirit send us but out into the world to connect? I saw it so many time and time again with the conversations that were happening yesterday at Alki Beach Pride. I saw some of you so full of the spirit and love and the power of being part of this community, of having connected to a source that is greater than yourself. You couldn't help yourselves but witness to the people that came by, the people that needed to hear a word of encouragement and love, that needed to know that there was a place that they would be welcomed and honored as their full self, exactly as they were. I know that so many of you have had powerful and transformational experiences of finding this place or some other church home that has taught you something about being of value to God that you needed so desperately. And it, so, for some of us, it's been a long journey. For some of us, it's been incremental, step by step by step, coming to trust and know that this is true. And for some of us, it's been easy to receive. Yes, I am loved. Yes, God is with me. Yes, I am being called to something, to create something. I am worthy of participating in the kingdom. And for some of us, it is still a struggle to trust any of those statements. But here we are in a community together where we affirm it together. And we build practices of teaching, fellowship, and sharing food and resources, and a prayer together to reinforce and confirm this message that we have received, this insight of being beloved, of being worthy, of being connected to God. I think, you know, we can talk about, like, the, the scriptures and the, the teaching that the disciples do about how this is the fulfillment of prophecy, and we can spend all the time in the scriptures and the psalms and the justifications and the explanations, but you know what I think it really is? At the end of the day, I think the thing that really brings people in, that excites a hunger for more and a desire to be part of a community is that experience of forgiveness. Once you know that you will be greeted with a learner's mind. You'll be greeted with a growth mindset, an expectation that wherever you are now, whatever you can't do now, you just can't do it yet. But we'll see you into the next. We're not gonna stop you or limit you. We're not gonna look at you at whether you have or don't have mastery, whether you have or don't have perfection, where you have it. Are you complete or are you incomplete? We're gonna assume an incompleteness amongst all of us and we're gonna work together to both accept exactly as we are and anticipate more. And I think so many people out there are hungry for that experience. I think that's why Luke says, obviously it was 3,000. Was it probably 3,000? Eh, but obviously there are thousands out there who are looking for that experience of forgiveness and welcome, who need desperately that healing and connection. Just look at how powerful recovery communities are in saying, yeah, I have a problem and through the grace of God, there is a power greater than me that can restore me to sanity. And that power, they don't say this explicitly, but they really do. I am loved. I matter. My life matters. And that saves lives. It saves so many lives. I don't know how many of you it has literally saved your life, but here it is offering you abundant life. Regardless. So we gather together 
for teaching, for fellowship, for sharing, for prayer. These are the pillars of what the church is and does. We do all kinds of other things, all kinds of other important gifts that we give to the world, but these are the things that established the church at the very beginning and continue to define the roles of the church today. And they are the things that will lead us in our ministry and our vision for the future because there are so many people out there who don't even know how hungry they are for the message of Jesus Christ. But we are going to be people who capture that insight and grow it inside of us so much so that it sets our hearts on fire to share it as I have seen so many of you do.